please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. I don't shy away from anything. The size and the magnitude of the companies that I take on, I think takes, uh, takes a lot of courage. I still think of this period at T-Mobile as a moment in time. It's a moment in time to accomplish something historic. My management style is one of massive communication. There is no way that my peer CEOs are going to do this. There's absolutely no way, but it's a competitive advantage, and I think it's worth billions, billions. John Legend, the outspoken, hard-charging CEO of T-Mobile. He's like a superhero. Our employees love the guy. Pleasure really broke the mold. You just build that network. This is what I do. John Ledger really came up with a formula that works. I mean, he had this somehow this understanding that they were going to be the cool wireless company at T-Mobile and he was going to attract millennials in addition to so many other consumers and do it in part around his own personality. If you landed from Mars and, and came here and saw this wireless industry, you would get back on your ship and go back where you came from. A lot of people feel that companies themselves are soulless, that CEOs are buttoned down, and that if you do become anything other than that, it's going to hurt your business model. You are a living, breathing example that that's wrong. Hello, who's this? This is Lisa. Lisa. John. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> oh my God, can I just tell you, you are the best CEO on this planet? Yeah, but that's easy, because most CEOs suck. <laughs> There's a shtick yeah. to John, but the shtick is completely in keeping with his company. That's why it's genuine. He's a rebel. He was kind of a cultural alien at the beginning. And he was kind of a rock star in a symphony orchestra. And eventually, the orchestra learned and loved to play rock with him. I was the middle. Uh, you know, I had a younger brother, younger sister, older brother, older sister. My father worked 42 years for Army Intelligence. Whatever money he had was in his pocket. I was a bad kid. I would sit in class, and they would ask a question. And I knew the answer, because I was pretty smart. But instead, I'd tell a joke. There's a schoolyard in all of us, but it's been beaten out of us. And the schoolyard was not beaten out of John. I was a very successful athlete, but I had a big, strong Irish mother whose job was to level the system. The feedback would be, you're not as good as you think. You're no better than your brothers and sisters. And I'd think, oh, well, OK, thanks, mother. And, but good, you know, good, good life. I wanted to go to the Olympics as a runner. I heard he ran a 406. He ran a 406 mile. That's very good. And I was recruited by Harvard. I told my father, there's no way I'm going to end up, you know, with those kind of white button-down shirts. And to give him credit, he just swallowed and he, he let me go. And I went to the University of Massachusetts because it was a period of time where all the top runners went there. I went to as a phys ed major. I moved out of phys ed when we had to do a test where they asked you to do a budget. And let's decide how much you want to be a phys ed teacher because here's how much you're going to make. And then it didn't, you know, it didn't match. I ultimately got a degree in accounting, and I was going to go to a big eight accounting firm, but instead I went into New England Telephone and ultimately worked for AT&T for 18 years. And you'd run with the torch. Many people know he was a world class marathon runner. So they give you this torch with a big butane, you know, flame on the top, and you gotta run, you know, like five minutes a mile with this torch. That level of competitiveness, which is individual as a sport, you know, carries through in the way he approaches his business. So he sets high expectations for himself. That transcends into what he expects from others at the same time. I still have the, uh, the outfit, uh, I think it kind of you know, doesn't really fit. Then I went to Dell Computer because I, I realized um, that, you know, I, I had a lot more to give, you know, and I wanted to break out of the big, uh, you know, hierarchy. And it was a time when Michael Dell was able to assemble 
a management team of people, all who could be CEOs, but went there instead to be part of a very high-powered team. Uh, I wouldn't have traded that uh, for anything. So I was running Asia, then I ran Europe and Asia. And that's you know when I left to run what was called Asia Global Crossing. So I actually was separate and simultaneously the CEOs of Asia Global Crossing and Global Crossing. Global Crossing is filed for bankruptcy. Its stock has fallen some 96% over the past years. Uh, and then I, I took uh, Global Crossing through Chapter 11. Our biggest investors are behind us. We have a viable path forward, and it's about IP, and it's a good day for the company. All of a sudden, I'm home. It's the first time I ever had to think through the question, uh, what do you do? I hated that question. Like, what do you do? And I, I you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm reading Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm, you know, all this. And my friends and my doctor said, dude, you got to go back to work. This is like, you know, this is on, I'm on match. You know, I'm doing all this stuff. Uh, I'm not a kid. And then this, um, a, a headhunter came to me and sort of asked as a favor, you know, if I would go, you know, kind of interview for this. We were in a very difficult situation in the U.S. We needed nothing less but a marketing genius in order to turn the company around. The odds of me working for Deutsche Telekom are like none. You know, I'm thinking, you know, that's not going to happen. But um, the more I looked into it, it, it seemed to me that what was seen as a total mess there was something, there was a plan. And I actually remember having lunch with him and he was debating whether he should do it or not. And we got to talking about the challenge that was there. Well, when I first met John, my uh, first impression was, here comes a very senior and serious guy. And he was dressed in a very elegant dark suit, but he had pink laces at the shoes and that caught my attention. So I felt something in this guy is different. I said, okay, here's the following like eight things. And if we can agree on these eight things, I, you know, I'll come, but I'm really not that interested. And then he started speaking, and what he said made a ton of sense. And they were all the things we ultimately did. What, you know, what we're going to, you know, spend on the network, we're going to invest in the brand, we're going to merge with Metro PCS, et cetera. We're going to crawl over to Apple and get the iPhone, no matter what we have to do. And, and we saw eye to eye. I am pleased to announce John Ledger has accepted the position of Chief Executive Officer for T-Mobile USA. Message is sent clearly, T-Mobile is here to stay. It's so me and it's so, you know, like core to what I was made to do. And uh, to think that I even thought about it for more than two seconds, uh, it's incredible. Uh, magenta. So if it's Magenta Monday and you're in my closet, what do you look for? Well, maybe a hoodie. No, it's a little hot. T-shirts have to be magenta, bike helmet, magenta, sneakers, magenta, sandals, magenta. Happy Magenta Monday. I have black jeans. The attire that he wears everywhere, he's like a walking billboard. Magenta and black t-shirts. It communicates right there that I'm one of you, you're one with me. And then hoodies and sneakers. And we're all in this together. And when I was in the Philippines in the call center, they gave me this shirt, which I've yet to find the right occasion to wear. but. Sure, the reason problem. why it works is because he's not a phony. What you see is what you get. He speaks to his customer very clearly, and he's intense. But that pink, I don't know about the pink. See, when I open my closet and I just have to pick an outfit, I know that I'm wearing magenta today. I feel super prideful in wearing this comp wearing our, our gear. I love you know, being a walking billboard for T-Mobile, and we really do bleed magenta. One of the most satisfying moments you can witness any day at 8 p.m. in any city in America, which is go watch the lights go out at a Verizon store. Lights go out, the first thing those employees do is get out of those clothes as fast as they can. Watch a T-Mobile store close and out the door dressed in as much T-Mobile and magenta as they possibly can are my employees. And if they change, it's only to put more on. And then that's brand, and that's a, that's a big deal. If you didn't know John and you just saw him, you'd come away thinking that John is a sort of unbridled free spirit uh, and the like. But John has a more sort of, I think, um, buttoned-down or conservative lifestyle than maybe most people would otherwise think. I got here five years ago. The company was really in a bad way. We were the fastest shrinking wireless company uh, in America. This company was in a do or die kind of a situation. We were the average guys, and actually we were 
at the bottom. I respect him so much because he is fearless. And when you're fearful, you're just another guy. The biggest problem with, with T-Mobile at the time was that it had just been a failed merger between AT&T and T-Mobile. AT&T is dropping its $39 billion bid to buy T-Mobile in the face of pretty fierce objections from both competitors and U.S. regulators. We're either going to be extraordinarily successful or this is going to be, you know, a rolling disaster. And we were also a subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom, so not a public company, uh, no iPhone at the time when everybody had the iPhone. We announced we weren't just going to survive. We were going to change the wireless industry in the whole world. We started with a manifesto. We stood for something. The uncarrier stood for solving customer pain points to fix a stupid, broken, arrogant industry. It's David versus Goliath, and he gives his employees a sense that, you know, you know, in a mission to unseat the incumbents uh, and let the big magenta machine sort of take lift. And, you know, and every story needs a hero and need, one needs a villain. You know, and we're the hero. And, you know, AT&T was the villain. And they took the bait. He was like, all we have to do is look at AT&T and Verizon and do what they're not doing. We are going to be the un-them. And we coined the term the uncarrier. Customers are living in fear or in shock of their bill. This is a big deal. And I'm pissed. And when I get pissed, it keeps me awake at night. And when I stay awake at night, we think of to do. He takes it to a level that is so in your face that you actually stop and listen. And isn't that exactly what you need when you've got four huge companies competing against each other? And there's no way that I was going to have the economics to compete with AT&T and Verizon. You want to be a CEO of AT&T? I passed that shit up a long time ago. So I knew I had to stick out. I needed to get us noticed. The big problem for Dum Dumber and Yellow is that this mechanism is working. We're growing. I'm not sure if you're dumb or dumber. <laughs> Does that tick you off, or is it all sort of part of the fun? Yeah, I, you know, to be honest, I don't pay any attention to it. It's, uh, you know, I think it's worked for him. We are the worst thing that ever happened to him. I am right in your face aggressive to them, but on behalf of people. The assumption is that these high and mighty duopolists that are raping you for every penny you have, if they could do something nice for you, they would. The f***ers hate you. I'm telling you. He's willing to say things that the other stodgier CEOs are unwilling to do, whether it's calling Verizon and AT&T dumb and dumber though he never says which is which. I don't think he cares much at all about Verizon and AT&T, but I think he sees that as a way to reframe the opportunity that's ahead of us. And it sure is a thing for us to rally around. I mean, you go talk to our frontline reps and they're like, you know, so intent on kicking the asses of our, of our competitors, which has been kind of refreshing. And so he's a very active communicator. I think it has helped without a doubt for not just the identity of the company, but for its actual business. If I fight with a big player and win 50% of the time, that's two and a half times my market share. If you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. I probably do six or seven hours a day just on social. Let me remind you again of, of the, uh, the week, come on, iPhone 8, 8 Plus, the watch, Note 8, $300 uh, trade-in uh, special on the iPhone. You don't expect a CEO of a company to be willing to spend that amount of time engaging with customers. It's something really special. I think I'm causing CEOs a problem because they, CEOs are led to believe you can't do this. How can I help today? No, I just want to say my favorite is a T-Force from Twitter. I think that other CEOs want to be as social as John Ledger is. I don't think 80% of them can be, and I don't think that 99% of them could come across as genuine. Oh, whoa, that was took the roof out. You know, the one of the things you can't do in social is it has to be you. You know, if it ever becomes, and you can tell who's, you know, if, it, if it's somebody being you, they vote you off the island. Twitter is where I see him most often. I'm 100% accessible. I've got almost 5 million followers, but my secondary followers, I think I've got 180 million. 
my daughter, she'd say, oh, you know, I want to talk to, you know, so-and-so. And And I said, oh, watch this. And I'll text either above and beyond, or I text Snoop Dogg. And she'd say, you kidding me? Why Snoop? Why would he text you? I said, well, come on. They they, they all follow me on Twitter. The ledger emoji, uh, of course, I knew it was a big deal. I've got uh, a whole set of gear just with the emoji. He's a mastermind of playing social media, so in a way, he is the brand and the brand is him. My T-Force team, the social media team, um, there's a group of them that you know watch on John's handle to see if there's a customer that's really upset. And a lot of times I will just, I'll reply, or I'll say, can I call you? And I'll just call. John's engagement, intensity and frequency in communicating with customers that way has had us build an entire social media platform that doesn't exist in other companies. You know, listen and do what they tell you is sort of the management philosophy. And he leads by example on that particular point. He listens better than anybody I know. Classic story from John's early days. He'd spend his evenings listening in on customer care calls. I got a problem with my phone. And they say, oh, you want to talk to sales? Nobody calls to say I love you. You know, they call when they're so frustrated. And I heard the way that they were taking care of them. And it was a big part of me thinking that if I could get the whole company to behave that way and care about that customer so much, uh, that we really could be different. And then he came back in and told us as a management team what we needed to do and fix, not the other way around. I'm all about the truly am, and I, and I always hesitate talking this way, but I'm all about the frontline retail and care reps. I mean, I firmly believe that almost no other interaction in the company matters besides those two. I often tell my frontline employees, everyone between me and you is the enemy. He's invested in the frontline. He connects with us one-on-one. Most CEOs don't do that. I don't see CEOs going into retail locations or call centers and really trying to connect with the people and really you know, removing those barriers. He is a general in an army of people who want to follow him because he's one of them. We made all of our employees stockholders and he fought hard for them because he believed there was much more power and commitment if you're an owner rather than just a renter. Warriors, they want to screw you. We just want to take you to dinner and a movie. I'm in, uh, I'm in Seattle. And you know, in all this stuff, strange as it may seem, builds a connection with, with that same audience, the, the young millennials. That's what they want in a wireless carrier. They want a wireless carrier with a CEO that has a doll hidden in the drum in the commercial. He speaks to every man very clearly. Happy Slow Cooker Sunday! So I do a Slow Cooker Sunday show on Facebook Live. He has not approached me with my Slow Cooker cookbook. I have aprons. Like my apron? Hats, the whole deal. I don't know why John Ledger has not done that. I have some great recipes for you, John. Are you listening? I do it every week, no matter where I am. Oh, oh my God, it's going to be great. And he's funny. It's natural. I make mistakes. The camera's the wrong way. Wow, Mama Lucia. I've got, you know, emoji ledger crock pots. I've come a long way since I was filming sideways. I hope it's not filming sideways today. I take it with me on trips. I do it from a hotel room. Today's going to be Thai chicken soup. It's going to be so fantastic. I have uh, tons of companies that want to collaborate, chefs that want to collaborate. John, will you come on our show? Snoop and Martha want me to come do it on their show. We're going to do a whole show on slow cookers. He can't cook slow. you got to cook fast on our show. Oh, but you're going to have a new slow cooker, too, you know. He's not the only one. Can I have this? You you can take that home. John, can I have this? Yes, indeed. The scale of it is off the charts. I'm going to make some brownies in these, some purple kush brownies. Thank you, John. Leisure. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a big deal. Have you seen my new book, John? It's called Slow Cooker. He's very, very energetic, very colorful. And top with a dollop of ricotta cheese topping. But don't underestimate how savvy he is. Very. This isn't a game. You know, this is a unbelievably valuable tool. But it's a competitive advantage, and I think it's worth billions. Uh, Billions. He's ripping up the script changing the industry because he doesn't care about the mold that his predecessors are working off of. 
walking into an industry without um, years and years of experience in that industry, coming in and taking the point of view, of, I'm going to be a rebel, I'm not going to play by the rules, I'm going to turn this upside down, I'm not going to ask for permission. Well, I think that's great. He's a heroic figure in a landscape filled with people who are just part of a bland army. I think that John absolutely has transformed the industry in many ways. You know, this is an unparalleled story. He's a guy who's got just what I would call incredible range. He can be charming on one hand and he can be a raucous Las Vegas nightclub act on the other. Magenta's cool. I think the magenta and the sneakers and the hair are one thing, but you know, what is really at the core of John is a very genuine passion to drive the T-Mobile business. I think he took a big leap of faith um, you know, and, and he's navigated that journey really, really well. So I think that was pretty bold and brave for him. It's hard to think that he's at the end game now. I think he has a whole host of things that he wants to do, a whole host of goals that he wants to meet, and I think he's just getting started. Five years from now, T-Mobile will be easily the number one wireless player in America, uh, no question in my mind, but will also be part of an integrated infrastructure Convergence will take place, content will be more prevalent and integrated, uh, but it'll be built around uh, uh, this brand. I still think of this period at T-Mobile as a moment in time. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a moment in time to accomplish something historic. So uh, I love it. <laughs>